We recently had one of the more amazing challenges come up because of coronavirus. Endoscopies are generally an outpatient and elective. And so when they canceled all the electives, all of a sudden we got all these customers asking us, what do they do with their machines for the next three months because electives are no longer being done. So if you just leave an AER full of water for three months, you're going to get a pretty atrocious pond scum growing in the inside of it. And it's a question that we've as a company, really never had to acknowledge before. People occasionally shut these off, but we're just like, yeah, as long as you're running your self-disinfect cycles on a regular basis, we can automate those for you if you want. You'll be fine. It's never been, oh yeah, no one is coming into the office. What do we do? From the basement to the boardroom, from ideas to innovation, you're listening to the Beyond Clean podcast, the central nexus for the people processes, and products that are pushing the sterile processing industry forward. Each week, you'll encounter diverse perspectives from subject matter experts across the country and around the globe. Frontline technicians, CEOs, engineers, and entrepreneurs with a common goal to help you fight dirty. Every instrument, every time. Whether you are tuning in for education or inspiration, we're glad you're here. Now, turn on those washers and turn up the volume. It's time to go beyond clean. This week on Beyond Clean, we speak with Chris Murphy, Director of Chemistry, Research, and Development at Cantel. Chris received his PhD from the University of Minnesota in 2010 in Physical Organic Chemistry. During graduate school, he worked almost exclusively with mass spectrometers and HPLC systems to study how molecules interact with themselves and other molecules. After school, he spent several years in industry working as an analytical chemist at such companies as 3M and Agilent Technologies. In early 2017, Chris left Agilent and went to Cantel Medical as a principal scientist and has since been promoted to the Director of Chemistry for Research and Development. His specialty at Cantel is cleaning and disinfecting reusable medical equipment such as endoscopes and ultrasound equipment. And Hank, I know you have a little bit longer relationship with Chris. You've known him longer than me, but from everything that you tell me the two of you have a lot in common especially related to your beards and chris is also <laughs> a very fun personality and so i just gonna set it up for the audience and say get ready to enjoy this interview this one's gonna be really relaxed and a lot of fun and chris is gonna bring character to the table yeah, Justin, there's two ways to get an interview on Beyond Clean. Number one is be active on LinkedIn in the sterile processing space. Use the sterile processing hashtag. Get our attention with great content and insights. Or number two, grow a great beard. Well, Chris <laughs> has done both of those. And so I'm pumped to see those two forces combine in today's interview. All right. Well, let's get right into it without further delay. Just a short break and we'll be back with Chris Murphy. You're listening to Beyond Clean, the global voice of sterile processing. Joining us now is Chris Murphy, Director of Chemistry and Research and Development at Cantel. Chris, really excited to have you on the show today to talk about chemistry. And a little known fact about me is I headed off to college with dreams of being a chemical engineer. I got a 10 on my very first chemistry test. Mind you, I had a scholarship. Never mind the fact that the class average was a 30 and that ended my career in chemistry. I'm really looking forward to hearing about your career in chemistry today. It's a great story, Justin. I'm really excited to be here. So a little bit of my background, if you want to go into it. I went off to the University of Minnesota. I got my PhD in chemistry, I think 2010, right at the height of the first Great Recession. And then I worked for companies like uh, 3M in their infection prevention division for a little while on analytical chemistry and uh, working in their stuff. I went to uh, drug delivery and then off to a company called Agilent Technologies, where I worked on mass spectrometry. Uh, and stuff like that. My current residence, which I've been since 2017, is Cantel Medical. For those of you that don't know what we do, the division that I'm in, Medivators, we make fancy dishwashers for endoscopy equipment. So if you go get an endoscope put in or up you in any number of orifices, my company makes the chemistry and fancy dishwashers that make it safe for the next guy. 
All right. So, um, yep. <laughs> it's hard to know where to go Let's from just there, take it, man. <laughs> but I want to know what is a day in the life here, right? Because you made that sound really exciting, but when you're doing your, your research and development in this area, what does that look like? Right. So like colonoscopies obviously are not something that happens on a daily or hourly basis at my company for testing purposes, obviously. So we try to avoid using clinical scopes for like real obvious reasons right now because they come with all of the grossness of clinical endoscopy equipment, right? So like if it comes out of someone's lungs, like right now we got to be worried about coronavirus. And like if it comes out of someone's behind, you got to worry about all of that stuff as well. And it doesn't smell very good either, right? So our research is actually governed by an international standard, an ISO standard. And for those of you that want to get really into it, like if you look up ISO 15883, that's one of our main governance standards. Through that governance, they've actually developed what the industry calls soils that represent different areas of your body that we can then use in an R&D environment. And so we don't have to be putting colonoscopes up people on a daily basis. So, Chris, a big part of this is going to be about really distinguishing. Like you mentioned soils, obviously, but I'm assuming that there are some other differences in that uh, clinical testing dynamic in a lab, you know, versus the real world scenario. And I don't mean that, you know, to say that you're not doing real things, obviously in the lab because you are, but I know from the user standpoint, there is always that pushback and maybe, you know, question or misunderstanding on what is a different, why is a different? Can you speak to that? Yeah. So again, this is really in my specialty right here. And that's like, how do you define or how do you actually clean something like really good? There is no like comparison to like a clinical soiled scope. Like if you can test on those, you're golden 100% of the time. But what we try to do with these artificial test soils is that we try to make them what we describe as like worst case. And then when we do testing on a colonoscope or a duodenoscope, we try to manipulate an abject worst case scenario in the life of that scope. In a clinical procedure, what would happen is that you would put a scope inside of someone and then you would take it out. And once you're done using it, the first thing that happens to that scope is that it's flushed with cleaning fluids right at the bedside there. So bum, 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 bum. it then goes into a sink where a technician will wash it and then they will test it to make sure that it doesn't leak. It doesn't have any damage, things like that. After it goes from that station, it then goes into an automated reprocessing, an AER, we call them in my line of work. So that stands for automated endoscope reprocessor. And then it is cleaned and disinfected using a really powerful high-level disinfecting agent. And then it's taken out and dried and hung and stored and prepared for a second use. So what does the difference then look like from the laboratory standpoint? Obviously, are you applying this clinical soil and then applying the pre-treatment and going through that same process? No. So when we test using clinical soils, we physically measure the content of our analytes in them. So like in this case, we'll just talk about protein. So we make sure that our protein is several thousand times higher than you would normally find it in a human soil. And then additionally, when we soil these scopes, we leave the soil on there for an hour or more. And then we place the scope directly into the automated endoscope reprocessor, clean it, and then test it. So it gets none of the pretreatment, the flushing, and it gets none of the sink side cleaning by a technician before it goes in our AER. Mm. Okay. On that soil piece that you mentioned before, you know, there's yep. these international groups that are really looking at standardizing, you know, what those soils need to entail. Are clinical soils getting better with time? So are the testing soils that you're using today better than they were five years ago or 10 years ago? Yeah. So Michelle Alpha, her papers go back to the mid 90s, question mark. Yes. That's kind of like when this stuff first started 
started coming into vogue, I guess would be a, a proper term for it. And since then, there's been really, really large like jumps and leaps and bounds in the in the test soil. There's an international standard. That standard is currently undergoing revision. And there's all kinds of other standard soils that exist now for testing different aspects of the machine. So like if you want to clean the scope, you have a bunch of different soils for where it comes out of a body. Or if you want to just test and make sure your machine is cleaning itself properly, there's other soils for that. That's great. So from the standpoint of the automated cleaning, because you mentioned that, I don't want to gloss over this. Yep. The regulatory structure, or I guess environment in the hospital setting and in the GI setting currently requires all of those steps. The point of use, the cleaning, the manual, you know, brushing and flushing onto the automated point. But what you stated is, you know, really the testing is more of an automated type testing. Do you envision a world in in the future that either the scope design or the equipment design gets to the point to where we may not need that point of use or that manual cleaning at all for these scopes? God, I hope so. I really, really hope we come to that point where we can just take a scope out of a patient, put it in a reprocessor, and then put it in storage right after that. So there's no human touch points. Like, I mean, we all know working in med device that like having a human touch point is like a pretty good source of error. And so regardless of how good or how trained your technician can be. Everybody has bad days. Everybody misses a step once in a while. So it happens. And like in the industry, it works out to be typically in the literature is less than 5% of scopes will come back testing positive for any number of bacteria and stuff like that. Typically, it's far less than 1% in the data that I've read, but it's still it's still a percentage, right? Mm -hmm. The ultimate goal of automation is to eliminate any error in a system. Yeah, and being able to diagnose an error when it happens with more accuracy. And and I'll even say, you mentioned flushing at the bedside, and, and Hank said point of use, and they typically refer to it as bedside cleaning in the GI realm. But yep. what would be also really good is we know time is not our friend. The sooner that not just the flushing, but the cleaning actually happens. And in a lot of GI suites or clinics, you know, in in the uh, non-acute setting, they're going right from one room because the situation is that it's a smaller facility or it's a Mm -hmm. smaller department than, you know, is often a very large surgical services outfit on multiple floors. And so a lot of times they say, yeah, we do the bedside cleaning and then we walk out this door and we take it into this door. But I've always kind of felt like, and I realize a lot of places will use containers. But there is yep. also an element of potential contamination just by leaving one room to go to, you know, the room where they're going to reprocess, not always referred to as decontamination, right, in the GI setting. So right. having that go right into a machine that could reprocess and then be wheeled out of the room or whatever would also potentially reduce contamination, do you think? Yeah, like that's the goal of it too. So like if you could just like have the device or have a pass through system in your suite itself and like literally take it out and put it in and then know that it's coming out clean and sterile on the other side, regardless of the situation. And then there's only one human touch point at that point. It would be amazing. The other thing that I think of Justin and Hank is the technology aspect of the endoscopes at that point. So if you can clean and reprocess endoscopy equipment to a really, really, really high degree of accuracy, then the scope manufacturers, Fuji, Pentax, Olympus, those guys, they can just start cramming technology on these things. And so you then you can start to thinking about like artificial intelligence and endoscopy equipment, uh, like 8K video coming out of them and things like that. So Chris, from your perspective, what's slowing down that move toward full automation? Is it the industry is not innovating as quickly as it could? Is it some kind of regulatory environment out there? Is it the consumer yep. base just not willing to pay the price that it would cost for that automation? Where's the breakdown there? I don't really consider it a breakdown. We're more or less a younger industry. We're starting to get some pretty serious regulatory headwind. I mean, that's that's a good thing, too, to have that regulatory headwind, honestly, in my opinion, because it keeps everybody honest. And then really, it's just a big industry, but it's not a big industry. So the amount of money for research and development, I mean, it's a lot, but it's not like 3M a lot or something like that. 
So Chris, let's get back then to this laboratory versus clinical use dynamic. And I know we've addressed a couple of these already, I think, but if you were to lay out the uh, primary challenges between, you know, what goes on on the manufacturing side of things and then what is happening out there in the world, how would you describe those challenges and how, from your perspective, you overcome them or can overcome them? Yeah. So like our biggest challenge as endoscope cleaners is like damage to the endoscopes themselves. I mean, so this damage occurs through just general use of them. But the problem with the damage is that it makes the scopes incredibly hard to clean. And fundamentally, like if you can't clean an endoscope, you can't disinfect it either. So like one of the big primary challenges right now in industry is like, how do you detect this damage and to what level of damage is important? So it's interesting that you bring that up because, and maybe you were just teeing me right up for boroscopes. I'm not sure if that's where your head was going. I've got another place to go in terms of damages too, but we're going to start here with the inspection because when boroscopes came to the market, I think it's critical. It's applicable in lots of areas, but when we're talking about the devices that have the longest lumens in Mm -hmm. the industry, (laughs) this is an area where you just, I feel like, gotta have it. And- I happen to have worked in the repair industry for quite some time, and we have some good friends of the show that were early adopters of this technology. We've had several episodes on it. I'm thinking back to an episode that kind of ran parallel to that was one with Jenny Gibbs, but also we've talked about designing a dream department with Sean Flynn, and this is one of his must-have technologies as he was putting that together out on the West Coast. And so the problem was nobody had ever seen inside him before. And so to your point, point, there might be discoloration in the channel. How much is too much? How do we know what the source of that is? And, you know, it's not like anybody's got a testing lab where they're going to be able to do all this culturing and sampling to figure out if the scope is actually contaminated. So that's been an interesting challenge. Obviously, you want to speak to that a little bit. And then I want to talk about preventive maintenance and damages after that. Yeah. So I do have access to a testing lab like that. So like I, I got a little bit bit of privilege in that matter. And when we do clinical analyses of scopes, every once in a while, we'll get one where we find out that it's harboring something or find out that we can't clean it for some reason. Anecdotally only on this one is when we do these analyses, we always find damage on the inside. And typically what it is, is a burn marks from cauterizers. So a doctor will pull a hot cauterizer back too fast and they'll catch the tips of it or biopsy tools. When they pull them out, they'll snag and they'll leave little tags on the inside of the endoscope. That's where the damage is. And unfortunately, in situations like that- You're talking about, like that, real quick, you're talking about the working yep. channel. It's actually yep, the carving working channel. up so yep. that there are divots and pockets yep. that could potentially... Now, those pockets and divots or those carve-outs of that channel, because we've seen that too when they use a brush and they don't have the bead on the end, and so it's exposed you know, twisted wire or steel that'll carve Mm -hmm. up the channel the same way you're talking about with the instrument. But are you saying that you're finding, I know you're saying it can't really be cleaned, but are you saying you're actually finding, you know, some sort of human debris, potentially even feces that is like dried or caked into those divots? No, 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 nothing, nothing like that. Nothing visible at that point. So when we do detections down to that level, we're looking for like one colony at a time right? One colony of bacteria. We're looking for like nanograms of protein. Our tolerances in the laboratory are much, much, much higher than they would be elsewhere in the organization. So like in a hospital or something like that, just because again, this goes back to that worst case scenario. We want to set our limits so atrociously high for ourselves that when we send something out, we know that it's going to work. Yeah, with certainty. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The margin for error, because your tolerances are so crazy that y- yep. you really are eliminating the possibility of that human error messing it up. Right. Yep. So in these cases, when you pull back like a biopsy tool and you scuff or scrape or, or nick the inside of that working channel, it's it's going to leave basically a grand canyon for microbes to hide in. Like, And a small brush isn't going to get down into those nicks or into those chads that you left behind. And even if they did, it could be such that the brush is just working it into a corner of that carve out, right? Yep. Yep. So in this case, like 
boroscopes uh, mandatory in my opinion just absolutely mandatory it's pretty crazy that adoption is so low uh, yeah at least at this point i think with cre and this was probably one of the biggest focuses in the industry up until covid19 was a lot of talk about you know super bugs and yep. before we go to that cuz i i want to talk about super bugs and like how that changed your world and your work yeah but from yep. a preventive maintenance standpoint right like maybe you yep. don't have the inspection technologies but getting this equipment on a rotation is so critical because if you can't see it then you definitely need a partner that's going to disassemble this equipment that knows it inside out, that that's what they do to be able to make sure that it's serviced on a regular schedule. And and I'm pretty sure the Joint Commission has a requirement around knowing when things have been serviced and having a preventive maintenance schedule in place for the equipment. Yeah. So there is really no excuse to not having a boroscope in your facility, in my opinion, right now. Those technologies are super, super cheap at this point. Like this is not a plug for my company, but we sell one and I feel that it's just a couple thousand dollars. And one of the bigger impediments to adoption, honestly, Justin, is as I think it goes back to your original point that like people just don't know what they're looking at. And so what I would encourage people to do is like get boroscopes, get it on a regular rotation, even after after use as part of an inspection after every scope use and just look for obvious damage. Like obvious damage is a cut in the channel or a nick in the channel. And those ones, even for an untrained eye, are very easy to pick up. All right. So let's go to the super bug question I already asked you and made you wait for. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did CRE CRE change your world? Uh, The FDA came back to us and said, we don't believe your claims, prove it. So we had to go back and do more testing on especially the duodenoscopes at the time. So additionally to that, this goes back to the original soils in question. FDA challenged us to develop a a harsher soil to test with, an artificial test soil. Again, we just had to redouble our efforts with a larger sample size for our testings. So Chris, I'm wondering, obviously in your space, you're well aware of the new attachments to some of these endoscopes that are coming out, single-use attachments. You're yep. aware of the full single-use scopes that are coming out as well. Is that being driven by the superbugs? And do you see that as the primary driver for that industry change? Or is there something else behind that? No, it's it's the ability to clean an endoscope is should be like requirement number one out of any new endoscope design. So when you're sitting down as a medical device and you're working out your product requirements, cleanability should be number one, in my opinion. And that's really where these like single use disposable things are are coming out of. So they're responding to engineering challenges really from these endoscope manufacturers more than anything else. Okay. Yeah. So if you're aware of the duodenoscopes, like the complexity of those distal tips and the elevator mechanisms, and then just how those things are operating, you can see just how complex and how easy it is for microbes to just hide in those nooks and crannies of those areas. Oh, we can't have an interview with a chemist without asking about chemical safety. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So uh, in the sterile processing space, you know, I've got a lot of soapboxes, you know, but this is one of my soapboxes besides just compensation for these teams. Mine but, too. We'll have a good time here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So talk to us about that. You're working with chemicals uh, every day. You're designing, you know, chemicals day. and chemical yep. like accessories and equipments, right, that use these chemicals. But I don't see a lot of conversation from anybody, you know, manufacturers, industry, regulatory, that's actually addressing the chemical safety part of sterile processing and endoscope reprocessing. Can you give insight around the real dangers and risk? You know, what are the unseen challenges out there? Do you have a different perspective maybe than I do? You know, where do you land on all that? I am hyper pro safety. Just the nature of the work that I do over the course of my life is just inherently dangerous. It's the same as working in like a reprocessing suite or a sterile processing suite or interacting with anything physically dangerous. Like it's just you got to be you got to know what's going to kill you and you got to just keep a healthy eye on it. I don't know. Have you guys ever smelled like our our Rapicide PA Part A product, the the paracetic acid that goes on? Not that I'm aware of. Yep. (laughs) Does it have a smell? If I haven't, if it has, if 
it wasn't yours, I've definitely yep. smelled it because I've been in a lot of those smaller diagnostic clinics and they almost yep. exclusively used OPA. Okay, so the OPA smells like rotten cake frosting to me. I really don't like that smell. Parasitic acid, which is another commonly used one, is it smells like super vinegar. Like it just really, really, really potent vinegar is what it smells like. I mean, for some people, that's a pretty good turn off. But chemical safety, like we're working with dangerous stuff. We're working with dangerous equipment. Like there's a reason why we wear gloves and masks and all that other stuff. Like it's a really big part of my day to day as well. Just making sure that what we send out of our factories is is safe for the end user. So Chris, it's funny because I mentioned being in those clinic settings or those diagnostic clinic settings. And usually yep. when I go in there, the room where they do the reprocessing and the high level disinfection using the chemicals that yep. you just talked about. I feel like it's like six or seven feet by four feet or five feet. It's crammed in there. The sink really yeah. can't even accommodate cleaning. It's two sinks sort of like feel like the conditions are always not ideal. But when you talked about that strong vinegar smell, it immediately made yep. me think most of the time something in that room is going through a high level disinfection process and I can't recall anybody wearing masks in that setting. Yeah. Are you talking about like a respirator t- style mask, an N95? No, even, even just the regular blue, you know, surgical mask. Just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, I just read this test report from eons ago at my company. Uh, when we first tested vapor on this thing, we literally like, wrapped it in a cube about the same size as our pieces of equipment and then test it in there. And that's to ensure that we didn't get any vapor off of it. And our main, our most popular flagship lines, the, the Advantage and the Advantage pass-through systems all have active ventilation systems on them. And we do do pretty extensive vapor management testing before we release new cycles and new products on these systems. I know the values that these systems get off even when they're malfunctioning in intentionally in the laboratory. And we have a very, again, this is worst case scenario, but there's a very real margin of safety built into these things. So speaking of of the margin of safety, we covered this a little bit on the scope manufacturer side of things. And we talked about preventive maintenance for the scopes, but can you speak briefly to that equipment part of it, because I can't tell you how many facilities we've been in consulting. Can we take a peek over at the PM log for the metavators yeah. for uh, their AURs? Yeah. And, you know, it's either not filled out at all. It's halfway filled out. You know, someone thought clinical engineering was doing something. They thought that the GI lab was doing it and it ends up no one's doing it or they're not doing it correctly. How important is that? And, you know, how do you plan for that as a manufacturer? Is it just come down to education and compliance on the part of the consumer to say, guys, you know, this is an expectation if you buy this unit that you're going to properly PM it. I'm first going to say that this is an expectation. If you buy this unit, I expect you to properly PM it, right? Okay. Um, Step one. Secondly, secondly, I'll just, we test for 50% over a one year, a one year maintenance cycle. So like, as an example, if we're going to put a new pump on an instrument and its maintenance is the one year period, we're going to make sure that it works for 18 months. So that's that's how we plan for that. Additionally, when we do our life cycle testing on these advantages and any other AER that we sell, any other metavator you sell to use your lingo, I guess, when we do it, we run it continuously and never stop it. So we do a full-on halt test on these systems. We just run them continuously without stop, without reservation, until they either fail or we reach the end of what we've termed a one-and-a-half-year worst-case life cycle. Wow. So you beat them up. Yeah, like we just, we're running, we're running for a new program at work. We're running them right now. It takes about a hundred days to do it continuously. And then the way we do our math is also important. So when we determine what is worst case, we take our shortest cycle. We assume that a reprocessing unit is working 10 to 12 hour days, five days a week. And then we multiply that out over a year, year and a half life cycle. And that's, that's how we get to that number. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty extensive. Yeah. Yeah, again, like we can't like in no circumstance in this can we actually do this like real time. So we have to just worst case it the whole way through. 
Well, that's the best way yep. to do it. <laughs> you you talked about yeah. having I mean, like, yeah. high <laughs> tolerances going yep. way above and beyond. Like that's how you get there. If you really want worst case, then in the middle of that processing, yeah. turn off the water, turn off the power, because that's what's <laughs> happening in these hospital <laughs> settings as well. You randomly come in, you know, overnight and your third shift says, hey, did we know that the water was going off? Oh, no, you know, facilities didn't tell us that. Well, this load canceled in the middle of it, you know, because now yeah. we don't have any water. Is it good to go? Is it not good to go? You know, what's going on with that? Like, there's so many of those types of challenges out there that are almost impossible to test from. I'm kind of being tongue in cheek there, but no, we recently had like one of the more amazing challenges come up because of coronavirus. So endoscopies are generally an outpatient and elective. And so when they canceled all the electives, all of a sudden we got all these customers asking us, what do they do with their machines for the next three months because electives are no longer being done. So if you just leave an AER full of water for three months, you're going to get a pretty atrocious pond scum growing in the inside of it. And it's a question that we've, as a company, really never had to like acknowledge before. So like people occasionally shut these off, but we're just like, yeah, as long as you're running your self disinfect cycles on a regular basis, we can automate those for you. If you want, you'll be fine. It's never been, oh yeah, no one is coming into the office. What do we do? Wow. I'll tell you what, Chris, this has been a very enjoyable interview, really one of the very fun ones. And who would have thought chemistry? (laughs) I try. I try, man. Tongue in cheek, but you really do give it that uh, Bill Nye science guy intrigue. I really (laughs) can't say enough about what a great guest you were today. I really appreciate you coming on and and sharing your insights. And we love hearing about R&D. I just think that's some of the most exciting conversations that can be had conversely i really like hearing stuff from your end because like i don't get out of the lab much unfortunately (laughs) nowadays so they don't let me like coronavirus or something like that they don't let you in hospitals anymore so it's really nice to hear it from your end as well and and explain like what we do in r&d to ensure that downstream the patients are safe well, we say it all the time. We, we'll have a good interview and I'm sure you'll be back. Let me put it that way. So looking, <laughs> looking forward to your next appearance in, a, in an upcoming season. Yeah, I can come talk detergents. I can come talk ISO 10993. I can, you know, you name it. We'll nerd it up sometime Ooh, later. 10993, we're in. <laughs> That was Chris Murphy, Director of Chemistry, Research, and Development at Cantel. And Hank, we're just over halfway through Season 10. And Chris did really a phenomenal job. And I and I know I was kind of ribbing him a little bit as we were closing the interview. But he really did make chemistry interesting. Research and development, I've always thought, is interesting. But he's just got a great way of making, I would say, what is probably a very detailed and, and for a lot of people, and it was for me, as we, as you learned a little bit about my very beginning of my college career, a very dry subject. And yet there was nothing dry about that interview. He did a great job of translating what he does every single day and making it really, really digestible and interesting for the audience. You know, Justin, I have said it before elsewhere about the shortcomings for training of frontline technicians around the hard sciences. You know, chemistry is one of those, but I know as a technician, I didn't know anything about chemistry and I wasn't expected to know anything about chemistry when I began as a technician. So one of the cool opportunities for podcasts like this is to expose those folks in the trenches, working with these chemicals, working with this equipment, you know, trying to make these medical miracles happen and keep patients safe to understand how that happens, how those chemicals come together, how to design. And as we discussed about the challenges, you know, how they may be thwarted sometimes or how we could do things that could stop that process or interrupt that process. So I really enjoyed learning from Chris. As we say often, we'd love to have him back for another round to talk about another topic in this queue to continue that science education in particular. 
Yep. And we definitely will. I'm not even sure what he meant with that particular ISO. I, I've not even heard that one. So I'm already intrigued. I'm going to have to go look it up. But that's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support Beyond Clean by subscribing on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, your favorite podcast application, or by downloading our new smartphone application for iPhone and Android. We'd certainly appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show. And if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on a future episode, just send an email to info at beyondclean.net. On behalf of Hank and myself, thank you for listening to this edition of Beyond Clean.